Greetings. Welcome to In Conversation with Trevor, brought to you by Heart and Soul Broadcasting Services. I go beyond the headlines and beyond the sensational. Today, I'm in conversation with Fred Swanecker, the founder and chief executive officer of the African Leadership Group. Enjoy this thought-provoking conversation. <music> Fred Swanika, founder and chief executive officer of the African Leadership Group. Welcome to In Conversation with Trevor, Fred. Thank you very much, Trevor. It's great to be here with you today. Fred, I absolutely love what you are doing um, with the African Leadership uh, Group. And I've been watching what you've been doing. Uh, you might not know this, Fred, but uh, I was invited by your campus in, uh, in Johannesburg, beautiful campus, uh, to talk to some passionate young men and women who are uh, doing amazing things and looking forward to, to be change makers on the continent. And when, as I was talking to those young people, I was inspired about uh, what the continent, the potential that the continent has. And I say to myself, what made you do this, Fred? What made you start this? Talk to me about where the idea came from and how you started uh, executing on the idea. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you for visiting the campus and for you know, inspiring our young leaders there. I know they, they enjoyed their interactions with you. Um, so perhaps to, to uh, understand what motivated me and my colleagues to launch this movement to develop leaders, uh, it's important to go back to uh, my upbringing, the beginning. Um, I was born in Ghana. I'm a Ghanaian, I still carry a Ghanaian passport. Um, but at the age of four, uh, my family had to uh, leave the country you know, in a hurry because a military coup had just happened. And uh, you know, my father was um, a lawyer and uh, Jerry Rawlings at the time had, he had conducted a military coup and then he had been sprung out of jail. Um, and he came back into, 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 into well, he had, he had conducted a military coup. He was, you know, caught, put in jail, and then he came, he was sprung out of jail and he came out and he came out with a vengeance for those in the, in the legal system who had put him in jail. And so, you know, my, my dad's brother was um, a prosecutor who had actually, you know, made prosecutor drawings and, and, you know, he was out to kill several judges and things like that. So we had to leave the country very quickly um, to um, move to Gambia. Uh, and then about six months after I arrived in the Gambia, there too, we experienced a military coup. Wow. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was five years old. And I remember having to wake up in the middle of the night and we had to take all our belongings and, you know, go through the bush to a safe house. And for about a week, I had to lie under the beds because bullets were flying through the windows. Um, and, you know, uh, it was a very vivid memory of um, the failure of leadership um, for me at that age. Um, and, you know, I continue to experience things like that, you know, being stopped in the streets by police asking you for bribes um, at a very early age. And I remember thinking, I thought the police are supposed to be protecting us, not bribing us, not asking us for bribes. Then fast forward, I moved to Botswana and everything was different. Botswana, things were, they functioned. There was no, there was, you know, no military coups. Governments changed peacefully every year. There was great infrastructure. Back then in the 80s, they had fiber optic technology. Um, if you wanted a phone line in your house, you just called the service, the phone service and they brought it the next day. You didn't have to pay any bribes. It was a very different country. And then I also spent about four years living in Zimbabwe. And at the time, Zimbabwe was also very highly functioning. Uh, I remember they used to deliver milk to your house in these bottles. <laughs> it was like, it's the stuff that I used to read about in storybooks, like what, what, what life in England was like, you know? And the education system was great. I lived in Bulawayo for two years, I attended Christian Brothers College. Before that, I was in, in Gweru and Chaplin for, for my ZJC. And, uh, you know, it was just such a highly functioning country. And so um, I realized that where good leadership was- in can, place, I, can I hold you there, Fred? Because that story of um, milk is a story, Fred, you might not be aware of this, but it's a story that I share 
wherever I speak publicly about what has happened to Zimbabwe. So when, when, when I was doing uh, primary uh, education, uh, in the evening, my mother would give us two bottles, uh, empty bottles of milk, and would go and put the bottles of milk outside on the street with two and a half cents in each bottle and would go to bed and sleep. When we got up in the morning at 6 a.m. before uh, bathing to go to school, there would be two bottles full of milk. One had a, 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 a yellow top, golden top, which was full cream milk, and the other one had a blue top, which was uh, uh, you know, not full, full cream milk. We got those bottles and put them inside. And as I always say to people, imagine what would happen today if I did that in Magwebe where I, where I lived. And the answer is, the milk won't be there, the bottles will be stolen, the two and a half cents would be gone. That's the change from the kind of Zimbabwe that we experience. But anyway, I broke a stride, uh, Fred. Please continue. <laughs> no, exactly, exactly. And what you said is exactly, uh, you know, a great embodiment of, of the change that happened in Zimbabwe. Because, you know, fast forward to, you know, 10, 20 years later after that experience in Zimbabwe, as we all know, you know, again, because of a failure of leadership, had really gone, you know, in the completely opposite direction. And the infrastructure was crumbling and, you know, it, People had so many people had left the country, and you know you could no longer leave your your milk bottles outside and expect milk the next day. Right? <laughs> so um, you know, through all those experiences, I re it really became crystal clear to me that if Africa was going to move forward, it would only do so on the back of good leaders. And if we were going to, unless we developed leaders in a more deliberate way, right? Instead of just hoping that they uh, you know drop on on us by accident, we would then not be able to truly control our own destiny as a continent. So that, that's kind of, these are some of the influences that really got me to think about. Can we create a, a, a specific system, you know, um, almost like a factory that can manufacture the leaders that we need so that we're not just leaving it to chance. Mm. Um, the other thing about my background is that my family has been involved in education institutions for a couple of generations. So my grandmother started a school, my grand uncle started a school in Ghana. My mother started a school as well when we were living in Botswana. But at the time she had a full-time job um, as a teacher and my dad had just passed away. So the parents in the town approached her and said, you know, we, you, you've got a very good track record as a teacher. Can you start a school? And she said, I can't start a school. I've got four children to look after. My husband has just passed away. And so they insisted that she, and she eventually she gave in and she started a small study group with five children and one teacher. Then it grew. And by the time I finished my A-levels, um, which I'd done at CBC in, in Zimbabwe, um, I had one year to wait before I went to college. So she made me the headmaster of the school. And at the age of 18, I ran the school and I, I saw the impact that education could have on transforming young people's lives. And, um, in a, and now, I'm, as I look back, I realize that that experience <clears throat> was preparing me to do what I did later. So, you know, 25, when, a few years later, I was 25 years old. I'd, I'd gone to finish college. I'd worked for McKinsey uh, in Johannesburg and done some work. And, and I'd done a little bit of a startup. And now I was at Stanford um, doing my MBA. And that's when all these things came together. I reflected on the importance of leadership, my experience in studying education institutions and thought actually, okay, why don't I create a school that will develop leaders, um, that will train the leaders that we need. And, and so began the whole African leadership group. Tell me, do you remember the process or the idea when you had that eureka moment, this is what I want to do? Do, do you remember and, and the process of that idea of that eureka moment? Yes, I vividly remember it. I was in between, so, you know, I had worked for McKinsey before my MBA and they had sponsored me to go to Stanford from, uh, to do my MBA. And so while I was there, um, you know, uh, I decided to do an internship between my first and second year. I mean, I went to Nigeria to help start up a microfinance institution. And I met all these wealthy families um, who, you know, were either lawyers or, you know, bankers and things like that. And they were complaining to me about the fees they were paying to send their children to expensive schools in the UK. They were spending about $40,000 a year to send their kids to the UK. Some of them had four kids. And I said, wow, why are we making such sacrifices to send our kids outside of Africa for education? So my initial reaction was, oh, here's a great business opportunity. Let me build a school and I can charge these rich Nigerians and make some money, right? Um, and so I went back to Stanford for my second year and I started writing the business plan for the school. But after about two weeks, I said, you know what, actually, Setting up a school is a lot of hassle. It's not easy. 
if I'm going to do it, let, me, let it solve a bigger problem than just, you know, this problem for these rich Nigerians. Let it solve a bigger problem that Africa has. And I've been thinking about this issue of leadership, like I said, since the age of four. And so I thought, actually, you know what, let's make it that, let's make that the focus of this school um, to train better leaders for Africa. Let's call it African Leadership Academy. And, um, you know, and we had a vision that it would, it would develop 6,000 leaders for, for the continent of Africa in the 50 year period and so forth. And uh, I wrote the business plan for the next six months. And so, uh, um, you know, by the time I graduated, I had a plan to start this, this academy. Um, and, uh, and then four years later, we opened our doors and then, then the academy became the network, African Leadership Network, became African Leadership University, became ALX. And today, that small seed of an idea has grown to a very large movement where we've gone from trying to create 6,000 leaders to creating 3 million leaders. And that's really the, the scale at which we're operating at now. So, so talk to me from the idea being transformed from an idea into a business plan, from a business plan into reaching out to uh, uh, partners, investment partners and so forth. Talk to me about that heavy lifting from the idea to project implementation, who you reached out to, uh, who made who made it possible? Did you do this on your own? Who else came on board? Sure, sure. So initially, you know, I, I took this idea to um, two of my former managers from McKinsey, Acha Leke and, and uh, Peter Momba, and they really liked the idea and they had seen, because they'd been my managers, they believed that I, I, I could actually get things done. So they said, well, we'll join you. Uh, they didn't quit their jobs, but they provided some, you know, initial seed funding. Um, and uh, then there was a, a, a guy who was a year behind me in Stanford who later on joined about a year later. Um, but that was sort of the co-funding group. And, you know, one of the things I really learned is that you can't do anything alone. You need great partners. Mm -hmm. So these gentlemen joined me as my partners. And then I graduated from Stanford and um, there were a couple of hiccups. Um, one of the challenges was that McKinsey had sponsored my MBA. And so the deal was that I was supposed to come back and work for them for two years so here i was i had this idea so my initial thought was you know what i'll start it and then after two months i'll find a ceo to run it so i can go back to mckinsey but after a couple of months I was, I was like no no no, i can't outsource my dream this is something that's too important i need to do it myself wow. so i called mckinsey and said, i'm not coming back and they said okay you owe us 120 000 us dollars and hmm. two months to pay it off so um you know here i was starting this school a non-profit organization i didn't have money and so uh, that was my first experience in fundraising, <laughs> right? So I had to come up with $120,000 very quickly. And um, I came up with 110,000, but I couldn't find the final 10. So for about a year, I was a fugitive hiding from McKinsey. They were calling, where's that 10,000? Where's that 10,000? <laughs> Whenever I saw the phone number, I would just ignore it. And eventually I paid them off. Um, and that's a very valuable lesson that you have to stick to your word. Because I came up, I found that 10K and I paid them. And, I, and, and then McKinsey Partners and the, the firm itself ended up donating about, you know, several million dollars over the years to this, to this program because they said, this guy's integrity. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and then they were, you know, my, my champions throughout. So that was the, one of the times. But during that time, the way I paid off the 120 grand is um, I borrowed money from different people. And then also I had raised the low capital I had raised from my co-founders and others. Um, I used, I had, I had set aside a, a portion for my salary and, but I had to give it away to now McKinsey, right? So I had no salary for two years. Um, and the way I survived was, you know, I slept on people's couches and um, I stayed in people's, you know, servants quarters and things like that. They had places for me to, to live. And then I made sure that I scheduled a meeting for breakfast, a meeting for lunch and a meeting for dinner. Pardon my love, but that's hilarious, man. Yeah, and, and you survived. That's how I survived because I had no money. So I would make sure I had a meeting. For, and then, of course, at the end of the, the meal, when the bill came, I would reach out like I was going to pay. And then people would be like, oh, no, no, we know you're an entrepreneur. Let me take care of this thing. And then I'm like, are you sure? And then they say, yeah. And then I'm like, oh, I survived another meal. Um, so that was kind of how I was going through. And then I remember one of the most, most challenging moments was you know, I got someone to sponsor me to go to the US to um, raise money. And I went to New York. I traveled from Wall Street, 
I took the train across the river to New Jersey to go and see a, a potential donor. And the meeting didn't go well. I didn't get any money. And um, I was now on the New Jersey side of the river, of the Hudson River, and I was looking across to Wall Street and I could see all these skyscrapers where you know all this money is being traded and everything. And I did not even have train fare to go back to the other side. So I was stuck and I was standing there and I was saying, what am I doing? I've got a Stanford MBA. My classmates are in those buildings making $200,000 a year and I don't even have train fare to go across, uh, to go back to, 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 to New York. To this day, I don't remember how I got back. I must have begged someone, you know, and I don't know, maybe a friend of mine eventually came and, and helped me, but I do not know, remember how I got back to New York. <laughs> wow. They say that trauma sometimes, uh, you know, erases your memory, but that was one of the, and this was, this was two years after I got. So for the first two years, it was very difficult. There was no funding. People were making promises. No one was giving anything. And then, so, so let me hold you there. Let me hold you there, um, Fred. So you, you, the, the, in between you and your mission and your passion are all these hurdles. Were you ever tempted? Did you have ever have a moment between the lunch, uh, the meals, to say, "What am I doing? Let me walk away. Let me give up." Was there ever a moment when you doubted your vision? Yeah, there were several moments, you know, like that time when I didn't have train fare to go back, uh, you know, when maybe one day I had uh, only two two meals and, and not the third meal, right? Yeah. Um, there were many times when I was like, why am I doing this thing? You know, I've got skills, I've got a network, I should just go and get a job at a bank or go back to McKinsey and make a lot of money. Um, but what would always bring me back and keep me going was just you know, I would look at the business plan again. I would think back to the vision. I would understand what is at stake if you can make this work. Yeah. And that got me back, you know, to fight another day. And so because the dream was so big, the impact was so big, it, it gave me the resilience to keep going and the passion to go through. And the, the passion that I had for this got me through all those ups and downs. And so and um, what, I was able to... What about, what about um, Fred, sorry to, to break a strike there. You, you, you are doing an MBA. Um, why not be patient and wait out to finish your MBA, finish with McKinsey, pay them off before you get on this? Talk to me about why the agency to, to, to jump in and do this before you are fully on your, on, 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 on your fours, as it were. That's exactly what my mother told me. She said she couldn't understand. <laughs> <laughs> because I finished the MBA. I graduated, I finished the MBA, but I was supposed to go and work for McKinsey for two years. She's like, just go and work for two years. You don't have any debt, you'll be free, and then you can start this idea. And so for two years, my mother did not talk to me mm. because she thought I was being reckless. I was taking too much risk. She called all my relatives to tell me that I had lost my mind and that I should go back to McKinsey. And, you know, and literally she didn't talk to me for two years because she thought, you know, uh, this guy is just, you know, he's lost his mind and he's, uh, he's, 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 he's too big for his boots. He should just go back and work. So, um, but the reason why um, I chose to do it is because um, one, the, the, I thought that the, the vision, the impact, potential impact of this thing was too important and too urgent for me to leave behind, right? Mm -hmm. Africa has a big problem with leadership. We need to get going yesterday in developing better leaders. So that was one. Second is, um, I thought that, you know what, if this thing fails, what's the worst thing that can happen? The worst thing that I can happen is, I go back to McKinsey, right? I use my Stanford MBA and my networks to get a, a great job. And after 10 years, I'd be, you know, five years, I'd be a millionaire, right? Guaranteed back, backup plan. So I thought, you know what? My worst case option is better than the best case option for 99% of people in society. So what I'm really worried about, what is, why am I not taking the risk? And one of the things that, I often say now is this is in the African issue group, we talk about doing hard things. And, and it really comes from that moment where, um, you know, I, I, it, it became very clear to me that those of us who are privileged yeah. enough to have education, to have networks, to have, to be even to be healthy and to be alive in this, you know, the only way we can justify a privilege is by doing hard things and taking risk and doing bold and courageous things to solve society's problems. That's the only way we're justified because why, of all the people 
you know, who um, uh, lives in Africa. Why did I have the chance to travel all across Africa with my parents? We were not wealthy or anything, but we, you know, I had three meals a day uh, as, a, as a child. Uh, I had education and I had a roof over my head and I was exposed to Africa. And then I got a scholarship to go to the US for my first degree. And then I got a great job at McKinsey and then they sponsored me for my MBA. I had all these opportunities that were given to me. And so because um, I want to continue having this cushy life, I can't take a risk. And I, and, 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 and uh, I must just continue enjoying my nice life. I said, no, what, there's, I'm one in a million who got these opportunities. The only way I can justify having these opportunities is by creating opportunities for others. Mm. And otherwise I don't deserve these, these chances. So that's, that's you know, one of my, my mantras today is that everyone who is privileged enough to be where they are, you, if you're not doing hard things and solving the biggest problems, then you don't deserve your privilege. Mm. Um, and that's, yeah. what, that's, what, that's why I kept going. You know, I, I, I always want to press my guests and ask them the question, which I'm going to ask you now. I, I can sense where your passion for leadership is, it comes from. I can sense where your passion for education comes from. But I want to know where does the passion for doing hard things come from? Where did that come from? Where you, you're walking away from an opportunity to be a millionaire and you think of uh, creating opportunities for other people and not yourself. W where did you find that in yourself? Yeah, I mean, it, it comes from this really thing. I mean, maybe is it, is it guilt, <laughs> you know, that feeling that I, why am I so lucky and others are not? Is it a sense of obligation? Um, I don't quite know, but it's really saying that, you know, I thought that it was not fair that I had these opportunities. Life is not fair. The only and perhaps it's a way for me to try to make it as fair as possible and to make perhaps justify for me why I was the, the blessed with, in the way that I was, mm. right? Mm. And that's really uh, the, the thing. And, and, and you know, uh, if I didn't at least try to help make a difference in, in the lives of other people, then why was I given all these opportunities? Yeah. You know, and that's that's really the, you know, and then also um, there's something um, very addictive about working on a vision that is bigger than yourself. Right. I mean, I could see that if we, if we pull this off, the entire continent of Africa would be transformed. So talk to me, Fred, talk to me, Fred, about I love the way you put it across. There's something about uh, addictive about working on a vision that's bigger than yourself. Talk to me about that. Can you can you unpack that for us? Yeah, I mean, most of our, you know, if you think about it, every human being, I, I'm not, you know, the science behind this strives to matter, right? So you talk, you know, there's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, there's the the very bottom of it is basic needs. You need food shelter, clothing, and so forth, right? So people first try to achieve that. Then they get to the next level, which is safety and security. You know, do you have a job, employment, you know, physical security and so forth. After that, they strive for love and belonging, right? They want to belong to a community, to have relationships that are healthy and so forth. Then they go to self-esteem, want to feel good about themselves. And then finally, they get to self-actualization, which is legacy and making a difference and, 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 and mattering to the world. So most people get to self-actualization at the end of their life. After they've accumulated things for themselves, they've you know, had a great career. And then they, and very often the career that they work on, they, they are able to sort of somehow divorce that from the impact that they want to have. And then you find people in their 60s and 70s when they're retired, oh, let me give back. Um, and they've finally come to the realization of what matters in life. I suppose I came to that realization much earlier than most. You started at 18 when you became a headmaster of a school. Yeah, Am I right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so I was self-actualizing at that point already. I could see impact. <laughs> right. And then, you know, I went to um, and I, you know, and then all the ex other experiences that I'd had, even, even working with McKinsey in those early days, the projects that gave me the most meaning and fulfillment were the projects where we were working outside of South Africa, in Ghana, in Nigeria, and Tanzania, and where, and I could see the just you know, the massive change that we were 
bringing in, in those countries. Um, and so, um, you know, the, 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 the ability to work on something that gives you true meaning in your life, um, it actually speaks to the highest ideals of human beings. And the greatest motivator of ours. Now, many people only realize that towards the end of their lives. But, um, you know, uh, I was fortunate to realize it earlier. And so that uh, is something that, you know, will make you break through walls and will take you through all these ups and downs because you know that this, the prize here is big. It's bigger than you. It's going to make a real difference. It's going to change the world. And that's what, you know, motivated me to continue going and to go through all these ups and downs. What, in your view, are the key attributes of a, a good leader? Point number one. Point number two, what specific challenges have you witnessed as far as African leadership is, 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 is concerned? Great, great question. So I define leaders as agents of positive change, right? And uh, in my mind, there are five characteristics that uh, make uh, good leaders. And these are the traits we look for in the young people that we select uh, develop and then later connect through the African Asian group. The first trait is passion. You need to have that fire in your belly, that thing that keeps you going, um, you know, towards uh, your, your objective, and that'll take you through all the ups and downs, right, that you have as, as a leader. The second is courage. Driving change in society is difficult. You're going to have to do hard things. There'll be lots of resistance against you. Um, you're going to have people who will be fighting the, 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 the cause that you want and you need to change the status quo and you have to be willing to, 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 to go against uh, some very difficult forces. So courage is, a, is an important thing. The third is um, resilience, right? I talked about that earlier. You know, you're gonna be knocked down over and over and over again. You have to pick yourself up and keep going, right? And the fourth is values. Do you have a good moral compass, you know, integrity, humility? Can you take, tell right from wrong? And then the final fifth thing is imagination. You've got to be able to imagine a better world and to imagine a better future for your organization, for your country, for your community, so that even those who follow you and who partner with you as a leader can be inspired and want to go there with you. Right? So those are the traits that I think make good good leaders and, and, and um, we look for those. I can tell you that academics is not a crucial factor in good leadership. Right? You need some intelligence, you need some basic knowledge but you know um this is not about book smarts right you cannot study to become a leader you learn leadership by, by leading you have to practice it you have to do it by example and um and and and, and so those are the things that we look for and you asked about what challenges do i see with african leadership yeah, yeah. let's see if we break it down into public sector versus private sector leaders. Yeah. in the public sector i think the single biggest challenge we have is that um you know, many of the leaders that we have do not see themselves as servants of the people. Um, and uh, they are primarily interested in enriching themselves or in gaining power and staying in power and not really thinking about how to move the country, uh, their countries forward. They don't have that imagination that I'm talking about. Um, they, and, and, and their value system is, 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 is often, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, not in the right place. So we have had, lot, and so, so that for me is, is, is one of the biggest challenges. I think another big challenge we have is that um, governments get in the way too much, right? So in my mind, government should do three things and three things only. They should set the rules, they should enforce the rules, and they should get out of the way. I like the last one, by the way, get out of the way and let people get on with doing things. Exactly. Let the ingenuity and creativity of your, of your citizens come to life and the entrepreneurial energy and everything. But too often, governments are in the way. They don't see themselves as enablers. They are blockers. And so, um, you know, that's the, 
uh, that mindset needs to be paid. So that, those are some of the issues that I see in, in public sector. Uh, another issue I see in public sector is the generational gap. The average age of an African president is in you know, 70s and 80s, whereas the average age of an African citizen is 19. We have a young population and the fast growing population, 70% of the electorate is below the age of 30. Yet these, you know, septuagenarians and octogenarians are running the, the continent. Who, who won't get out of the way? Who won't get out of the way, Fred, for the young people to do what they need to do? Exactly, they're in the way, you know? And you go to uh, France and Macron at 45 or whatever is running the country. And, you know, David Cameron in the UK, or Justin Trudeau in Canada. These are countries that have average ages of 45, 38, and they have, you know, much younger presidents than we do in Africa. So these are some of the challenges that I, I see mm -hmm. in the public sector. Tell me, so that's the public sector. Do you see any differences in the private sector? Yeah, in the private sector, I think there are, um, you know, some similar uh, things, but I think by and large, you know, there's a higher bar for performance and the consequences of performance in the private sector because shareholders can yank you if you're not delivering value, right? Uh, you can be fired <laughs> by your board or by you know, your CEO if you're not delivering value. So there's a much higher bar for performance. It's much easier to correct for people who are not adding value. Um, transparency is much higher in, pub, in private sector, so it's, it's more difficult to be corrupt. Um, and um, you know, so I think that the, the, the quality of leadership generally in the private sector is much better than you should find the public sector. And the best talent today goes into the private sector, right? Because they know they can be, you know, unencumbered. They are given more space to be innovative and to, to drive their vision and to do things. So um, I would say that average quality of leadership in private sector is much better than public sector. That being said, when I look at the private sector in Africa, what I see are uh, people who are not being bold and courageous enough to really tackle big problems. They are all copying each other. So there's a lot of me too in, in, in our businesses. We're not being radical and uh, you know, innovative enough, right? So entrepreneurship and innovation, I think one of the, my, my beliefs is that constraints drives innovation. And Africa mm. has a lot of constraints, right? We don't have time, we don't have money, we don't have infrastructure. So we have to reinvent and reimagine everything. And we should be seeing a lot of radical solutions coming from the private sector in Africa. We're not seeing that enough. The other thing that I think we, we, we are not doing in the private sector is we're not building institutions that live beyond those who found them, right? So we're very good at starting projects, but we're not good at building institutions that will live beyond the founders, right? And so this, this speaks to creating intergen, you know, businesses that will survive, for example, past the founder to the next generation, or that will become a professionally managed organization. And so that, you know, mindset of I need to build something that eventually uh, does not need me anymore. It's a very, very, um, you have to be incredibly, um, you know, self-confident uh, and to be willing to, to make yourself irrelevant as a leader. Mm -hmm. And I think two people, many people cling on, they hang on, and they don't want to build an organization, empower others so that eventually they are no longer needed. Well, why do you think that's the case? The, all the two uh, weaknesses that we've highlighted right now, we, we, we're not uh, daring enough, we're not bold enough, courageous enough, we're not building institutions that will last beyond uh, when, when, we, when we're gone. Why do we have that problem? Well, I think it goes back to human nature and human psyche. You want to be needed. You want to feel important. And to say, I'm going to work myself out of a job, I'm going to build this organization so that is so strong. I'm going to be, have such powerful leaders around me, people who are better than me, who compliment me, and um, you know, outshine me in many ways, so that eventually they don't know who you are and the mm. organization. Right? You know, so but you have to um, be, your ego must be very low <laughs> for that. Yeah. And the problem is we have a lot of people. You know, ego is a, is a, it's, it's a, again it's a natural human thing. Is it, so, so afraid, so afraid I'm going to stop you there. Is it a natural human being, Fred? Or let me pose another question. How Can we transform African leadership without transforming the African political leadership? Is it possible to do that? Is it not standing in the way? Is it not affecting the way that we lead in the, even in the private sector? Or am I uh, getting things very wrong, Fred? No, no, no. I mean, we absolutely have to transform both the private sector and the public sector, right, if we want to transform Africa. So... You know, 
we have in the African leadership group been working a lot on the private sector, developing entrepreneurial leaders, developing leaders to go into private sector companies. But we recently also started doing work with the public sector because we, you know, we realized that we cannot transform Africa without improving the, the public sector in its delivery. So we need to tackle it from both fronts, right? You also need to tackle leadership in the NGO sector. Yeah. Right, you need, need better leadership. Um, but the, the, you know, the, 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 the techniques will have to be different because the challenges are slightly different. You know, um, and so, for example, one of the things that is a challenge in, in Africa is, and in fact, globally, is democracy. Um, because the skills required to win an election very often are not the skills required to govern effectively. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to win an election, you have to be able to lie, to steal, to manipulate, people, to form relationships and coalitions with people whose values do not align with yours just to get power. And then once you get power, those are not the skills that tell you how to govern properly and how to make a budget and, and how to you know, hold your leaders accountable and how to you know, eliminate corruption and deliver services to your citizens and you know, manage the tax authority properly and the finance ministry properly. Those are not the skills to win that you, you were getting to, that you, you had that you leverage to win power. Mm. So, so it does this, and you see that even all over the world, that's how Donald Trump becomes a president. That's how Boris Johnson becomes a president, right? Because it's a popularity contest. It's not actually measuring your skills. Whereas the private sector, you need to have skills. You're not just going to become the CEO of a company by just being popular and dancing and singing people and giving them false promises. They need to see mm. you deliver, mm. right? And if you don't deliver, you're fired. Uh, and I don't need to wait five years to fire you as an ineffective CEO. Two mm. months, three months of performance, you're gone. One year most, you're gone. Whereas in the private sector, so the... You know, I mean, so in the public sector, I have to wait five years before I can, I can, I can, you know, get rid of it. So, so you know, it's a very difficult thing. There's no silver bullet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let, let me take you now to talk us through, Fred, your uh, the stages of uh, your organization, uh, the, the, the structures that you've created. In the first instance, you have the African Leadership Academy. Um, why the African Leadership Academy, then the African Leadership University, then the African Leadership Network, and then the room. Walk me through the stages and the thinking in creating those structures, uh, Fred. Certainly. Um, so the first thing we started was African Leadership Academy, which is a two-year university program. We select the top young talent from every country in Africa. It's sort of at the A-level years. Um, and then they come there. During that time, we infuse these young people with a passion for Africa, for, the, for them, this is the first time they're learning African history, or African geography, and meeting people from other parts of the continent. We also develop their leadership skills and entrepreneurial skills, and we prepare them for entering top universities around the world. 80% of the graduates from this academy leave Africa, and they go to Stanford, Harvard, Yale, MIT, Oxford. At any given time, we have about 400 of our graduates attending top colleges in the US. But we wow. don't leave them there. We, we bring them back to Africa every summer for internships. We have a whole system that manages this alumni network because we, make sure, we want to make sure they come and work on the continent. And they have an agreement with us that if they don't return to Africa by age 25, they have to repay the scholarships that we've given them. And most of the people come in full scholarships. So that's the, the academy. Uh, but then after about you know, eight years of doing that, it was working very well, but it didn't sit well with me that we have to send our talent outside of Africa to go and study for their university. I said, we need our own African Harvard and Yale and Stanford, but let's do it in our own way. Let's not just copy mm. those guys. Mm. And that's when we created African Leadership University. That's a tertiary model where we get people post, you know, um, after they finish high school. And then we take them through, again, developing them as leaders and entrepreneurs. And um, one of the things that's unique about this university is that most universities give students a menu of academic disciplines, a Bachelor of Arts in History, a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry. We wanted to create problem solvers and innovators. So we give them a menu of the seven grand challenges facing Africa and the seven great opportunities. So these are big mm. problems like health climate change, governance, youth unemployment. And we say, don't choose an academic major, declare a mission for your life. Which of these problems are you going to solve? And then you design your learning experience around these problems. Right? So the end goal is to create problem solvers and innovators who have, and people who have learned how to learn, not to memorize facts and figures. Mm. So that's the, the today we have um, 2,000 2, students and we're gonna take it to 20,000 the next five years. The academy is very small, only 250 students. So the, the step up from, the academy to the university, we grew our 
uh, capacity by, sorry, the, the scale by 10 times, and it's going mm. to grow another 10 times to 100 times the regional size of the academy. Wow. Then uh, about four years ago, we said, you know, um, the world is going through a digital transformation. And uh, we um, need to start thinking about developing skills for the fourth industrial revolution, right? Software engineers, data scientists, cybersecurity, cloud computing, because you cannot be a leader these days without understanding those things. Right. Digital leadership. This was even before the pandemic. So we began something called ALX. And ALX is not a high school, it's not a university. But what it is, we take people who already have college degrees and we really skill them to become software engineers and data scientists and cybersecurity specialists and so forth. And we also take people who never even went to college and we take them and we we reskill them. So today, we are training 100,000 software engineers across Africa. Uh, We have grown by 2,000 times in the last 12 months. And our ambition is to train 7 million uh, um, data scientists, software engineers, cybersecurity, because that's the skills that are needed in this moment. And that's going to continue as the world becomes more and more digital. Mm. So ALA, ALU, and ALX, think of them as the the talent factories where we select and, and develop this talent, this leadership talent. But over the years, people will come to us and say, you know, we, we know you've got the best talent in Africa. You're producing this, these millions of, of people. Can we hire them? Can we invest in them? And I would send them to ALA today and then send them to ALU tomorrow, send them to ALX. And it's getting just confusing. So we thought, let's, what if we created one room where we put all of our talents? <laughs> how, how big is this room? <laughs> it's a physical uh, and, an, and, and a virtual room, right? So we're setting up physical spaces in different parts of Africa where you can... Right all the talent in one place the ala guys alu guys the alx guys and any employer looking to hire them you just go to the room you can also go online and you want to find talent you go to the room.com and you can hire a talent so that way um you know, we can really build the the leadership capacity that we want and then and then connect it so ala alu alx is the where we produce the talent the room is where we connect the talent to each other into mm. opportunities mm. Um, and that's 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 it. What, what what about the um the, the footprint, the African footprint? How how does it look like? Uh, where you concentrated most, or are you seeing an, an even spread of where you're getting the talent from and where the talent is going? So, this is our footprint today. Wow. These are all human beings, and this is where we are training software engineers, for example. Um. These are all, you know, some of the 100,000 people. You can see the clustering and the, the depth. Wow. Wow. So uh, we have a campus here in Mauritius. We have a campus in South Africa. We have one in Rwanda. And then these are all we are, we are p- people who are learning through us online. Um, and we are, we are soon be setting up talent hus- hubs in all of these places because we can then have blended learning experiences where you can come to a space and you get internet access electricity to, to do the online learning. But then we also have these physical campuses and these hubs uh, mm. that I mentioned. This is our footprint mm. on talent where we are developing, which we are developing all across Africa. Fantastic. Thanks, thanks Fred, for sharing that. So you want to say something? Please proceed. Yeah, and the other thing I want to show you is this. This is okay. the, the, the structure that we have. Okay. Where you have ALA, ALU, and ALX. Oh. And the scale, you can... 250 students a year, ALU will be 20,000 students. And then the scale ambition for ALX is 200,000. Yeah, each time we're growing by about 100 times. So that's the, and then they all feed in, into, into the room. So your ambition is to do 3 million African leaders by 2035. We're 30, 13 years away, Fred. Well, what's, what's, your, what's yeah. your feeling? Are you going to hit that, that, that uh, mark? We're very much on track, um, you know, uh, especially with what we're doing with, uh, you know, developing, uh, you know, these digital leaders because we're growing very fast. You know, uh, for example, one year ago we we're training fifty software engineers. Today we're training a hundred thousand. By end end of next year we'll be training about two hundred fifty thousand. Mm. So we're we are, we have we're scaling very fast. In fact, just today we announced an acquisition of. Um, of a, a software engineering training program in Silicon Valley that we are using to 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 train these these digital leaders. So, yeah, we're on track, and uh, we are. I think we'll even exceed that three million number. 
Mm. And talk to me about the you you were you, when you started you saying these Nigerians. I mean, you remember you you looked at these Nigerians wanting to pay high fees for their kids to go to uh, to, to 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 the big universities. What what's the formula for uh, fees, uh, tertiary fees, and tuition and that kind of stuff? Do they do these kids have scholarships? Where do they get funding to be uh, your students? Excellent question. So the African Leadership Academy. Um, it's a non-profit. Um, it costs for about uh, 30,000 US dollars per year for someone to attend that. Most people in Africa cannot afford that. So we raise funding from donors um, and uh, we give about 95% of the students scholarships and about 80% of them on full scholarships. Um, so that's supported by donors and you know you have to get in on merit and we have thousands of applicants. We pick the top you know, 125 every year. African Leadership University, it, uh, it costs, um, the first campus in Mauritius costs about $15,000 a year. The Rwanda campus, we, because it's not fully residential, you can come there as a local for about as low as $4,000 a year. We're actually now reducing the cost of about $2,000 a year, but still most families in Africa cannot afford to pay that. So that's also a nonprofit. If you can afford to pay the fees you pay, if you can't, you know, we give you scholarships. Like we have a big partnership with MasterCard Foundation that mm -hmm. is providing this for thousands of young people to go to the academy, I mean, to the mm. university. Mm. So ALA is a non-profit, ALA is a non-profit. Now, ALX and the room is a for-profit. And there, the model is that we are training all this talent for free. They don't pay upfront. Yeah. But we are building um, a, a B2B business where we charge employers to access the talent. Uh -huh. So employers pay to be able to recruit from us. And then we're also outsourcing some of this talent. So we are building a company eventually that will look like a technology consulting company like Tata Consulting Services, Infosys, Accenture, where we can leverage this technology talent we have developed to digitize your entire, you know, uh, tax authority as a government. We can come and help you as a company manage your cybersecurity or your sales force, or we can help you, you know, manage your cloud and leveraging this human capital that we have to deliver value to businesses. And then the revenue that we get from that you know, technology services company, we use that revenue and the profits to train all these millions of people for free. Mm. In, in terms of disciplines, um, I, I, I hear from what you're saying, lots of focus on, uh, uh, on on technology. Which other areas are you are you strong in and which other areas are in demand? So we focus on solving problems. So as I mentioned, we, we tell, we give, um, the young leaders we're developing, whether it's at ALA, ALU, or ALX, this menu of the, of the big challenges facing Africa and the, and the great opportunities. So um, I'll show you that in a second. But essentially, the, um, the, the, the menu of the grand challenges and great opportunities is how we think about it. We don't think of it as academic disciplines. Right. Because we're here, we're here to produce, um, you know, problem solvers and innovators. So we have identified this list, what we call the seven grand challenges and seven great opportunities. Mm -hmm. And this, this is the list. So these are the problems that we believe are the most pertinent and pressing to solve in Africa. Mm -hmm. Urban, there are 800 million people who are going to move into African cities in the next 40 years. That's gonna create all kinds of challenges on housing, sanitation, urban planning, et cetera, education. We have you know, the youngest population in the world. We have to figure out how to educate them you know, you know, how do you think about, you know, innovation, education, technology, education policy, education, finance, et cetera, infrastructure, healthcare, climate change, governance, job creation. So we asked the leaders we're developing to solve these problems. Right. And that's the way to think about the discipline, the, 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 the menu. We're not giving you history, chemistry, biology that you might find. We think solve these problems. <laughs> and then we have another um, group of what we call the seven great opportunities. These challenges are things where Africa is not starting with a, in, a, in a good place. Right? We have, to, you know, it, we're not blessed. But these seven opportunities where Africa has unusual competitive advantages, where we are blessed and we should be world-class in these areas. Right. So we have the culture. We have the largest amount of arable land that has not yet been cultivated. We have abundant rain, abundant sunshine. We need to be, you know, um, the world leader in food production, but yet we, we spend $50 billion importing food into Africa that we can grow. 
natural resources. We are blessed with gold and diamonds and oil. How do we actually add value and not just export the raw materials? Art, culture, and design. Right? The Nigerians are showing us how this can be a very lucrative means for development with what they're doing with music and film. Mm. How do we make this more right? The good thing about art, culture, and design is that it doesn't require much capital. It's just your intellectual capital, right? your brain power. Tourism, the empowerment of women, regional integration, wildlife conservation. So we think these are unusual assets that Africa has. You're right. And that we, so the way to think about it, whether you are leveraging technology or you're leveraging your leadership skills and pick those problems, and then you now curate your learning experiences around those problems. So it means bringing different disciplines together, right? You have to yeah. understand the, the history of the issue, the politics of the issue, the technology, you know, the science of the issue. And then you bring all that together. But the aim is to develop problem solvers and innovators, not people who have memorized facts and figures. say um, there was a time when your mom didn't talk to you for two years. Are you now back on talking terms? And what does he have? What does she have to say for what you've been able to do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, my mother didn't talk to me for about two years. This was from 2004 to 2006. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was a very interesting time in our lives because I've been very close. I've always been very close to my mother. Uh, and um, then after, you know, one of the other things that didn't, that didn't impress her was that, you know, when I came out of college, I was working for McKinsey and McKinsey used to fly me around in business class as a 21, 22 year old. And so she used to love telling her friends, my son flies business class. Right. Here I was in poverty and I, and I didn't have, um, you know, a roof over my head and I was sleeping on people's couches and I didn't have train fare to go across the bridge. And so she, you know, I think I would say she was maybe a little bit embarrassed by this Stanford MBA guy who's now uh, in poverty. Um, and, uh, but then after eventually, you know, the school opened in 2008, four years after I graduated from Stanford and, you know, uh, it started getting more pres- prominence and, you know, Barack Obama would recognize me at things. And then, you know, uh, I was getting all these awards and eventually Time Magazine named me one of the 100 most influential people in the world. Then, of course, she would always be proudly saying, that's my son. You know, Obama is just <laughs> my son. <laughs> so if, I think that after about two or three years, she eventually became, you know, uh, she realized that it was, a, it was where, we, you know, I was doing the right thing and she became my cheerleader. She, you, you, so you, you did at the beginning, Fred, thank you so much. You did um, walk us through the things that shaped you as you were growing up. What is it that you got the most from your parents, uh, Fred? I'll tell you a couple of things. One is um, I got a very um, deep appreciation for the importance of education. Mm. Right? They made that we were educated. They made a lot of sacrifices, you know. They, uh, they, we didn't have much money growing up, but they made sure our school fees were always paid. And that would be the last thing they would sacrifice. They got us extra lessons. They invested in books for us. That was the you know, primary thing that they invested in. And um, they also set very high standards for us. So I remember at a very early age, my, I used to ask lots of questions and I was always curious. And, everything. and my, my father said to me, you're going to be a Rhodes Scholar one day. And I was like, what is a Rhodes Scholar? I didn't know what that was. Right? And you know, I was like nine or 10. You know? And I went and I looked and he explained it to me and, and, and I was like, wow, you think of me that way? So it gave me a lot of confidence and I didn't want to disappoint my parents because they had mm-hmm. such high expectations. Because young mm-hmm. people perform patients. So if you tell them that you're going to be great, then they believe that they'll be great. And then they actually, their confidence rises and then they actually you know, um, live up to, to those expectations. So they set very high expectations for us and you know, gave us the belief that you know, we should not settle for second best. We had to really strive to work hard to, 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 to reach those high aspirations. Um, and then finally, um, you know, they, they gave us good values. I think, you know, they, they really, uh, you know, ensure that, um, you know, we're not perfect. Me, myself, my siblings are not perfect in any way, but I think that our parents imparted, you know, values uh, into us um, and, and they lived by example. My mother was an educator 
Um, she, you know, she, uh, she unfortunately passed away a few weeks ago. Oh, I'm so sorry about that. Thank you. But until, you know, until her last moment, she was still running her school in Botswana. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, showed us what, um, you know, giving back to society and transforming lives to education looked like. So, you know, a lot of our, her legacy is, is in what we are doing now. The, the three million leaders that we're developing through the African Asia group. My sister in Ghana also has a school. Mm. Uh, focused on, you know, um, art and design, and she's an artist, and she's, she's she's running a school there, and she's building quite a big school there. Um, my other sister is the CFO of De Beers in Botswana, uh, and then my father, my brother, is a is a technology entrepreneur in um, in in Silicon in in California. So basically, three of the four children became entrepreneurs, um, and one is a, is an executive in a very you know large company. So. We've all been quite successful, and uh, clearly one of the things as well that we've got from our parents is the spirit of entrepreneurship and innovation. If three of us are mm. entrepreneurs, mm. Oh, what what has what life taught you, uh, Fred, about yourself and about humanity? What has life taught you about yourself and humanity? I mean, one of the things that it has taught me is the, about the importance of community um, and uh, relationships. You know, everything that I've achieved has been because of relationships and because of partnership with other people. There's no way I would be here I mean, if, you know, without other people who had supported me, who had invested in me, who had believed in me. And so I feel very humbled and privileged to be able to do what I do because of the support of others, whether it's people on my team, whether it's people in my office, you know, my assistant, my chief of staff, or you know, my executive team, my board members, my investors, my donors, all of this stuff is because there's a whole community behind me and with me and like the young leaders that we're training and the faculty and everyone we're working together. So no one achieves anything great alone. Mm -hmm. um, you have to walk the journey with others. And so I spend a lot of my time, you know, investing in relationships, nurturing relationships. And one part of our leadership development model as well is, you know, we believe that your skills are not enough to be successful as a leader. Mm -hmm networks and relationships you need people who can help you in so many ways to progress in life so and one of the things that um i often talk about is that there are four stages to relationship building um you know the first is you meet someone in the connection and the connection mm -hmm. maybe chemistry you find something interesting about each other and you exchange business cards or phone numbers or email address whatever and then you get to the second stage, which is continuous interaction, right? You follow up on the person you met, you meet them for lunch, you have dinner, you talk to them, what's up, whatever. Very few of the people you connect with lead to continuous interaction. Most people mm. just never, never follow up and whatever. After that, during that continuous interaction, that's when you really get to understand the person that you get a sense of their values, can they be trusted? You get a sense of their passions, their interests and alignment. From that, you figure out, is this person a doer or a talker? You know, can you, and are they legit or not? And from that point on, you get to the third stage, which is trust, right? And then only after you have trust, do you get to the fourth stage of relationship, which is collaboration. That's when you actually do something together meaningful. They join your board, they invest in your venture, they become your business partner, they open doors for you. The problem I see most people make is that, and the mistake I see most people make is that they, they rush from stage one to stage four. <laughs> you meet somebody to give you money or join your board or open doors and they're not going to do that because you haven't nurtured the relationship you haven't gone through those stages and so one of my mantras is relationships not transactions mm. right best in relationships it also makes life a lot more rich to experience so most of the people that i build relationships i i build relationships for relationship's sake not for a purpose because people can see when you're using them to get something mm. so just build you know, it will make your life much more rewarding and enriching and fulfilling. And 95% of people you build with will never, you know, have any value to you in terms of commercial or whatever, except they'll make life more interesting and fun. But that 5% will be there when you need them. Wow. Wow. That, that's deep. That I love, I love that uh, those four stages of relationship building. Um, you very, very important. You, you have been recognized um, uh, Fred, by the young global leader, leaders um, as a young global leader rather, a TED fellow, uh, Aspen Institute fellow. I'm an Aspen Institute fellow, by the way. Uh, one of the top uh, 15 emerging social entrepreneurs in the whole world. 
Um, Echoing Green um, gave you that recognition. You have a number of uh, honorary doctors, I think it's three or four. In 2019, you were recognized as one of the, uh, as you have indicated, uh, Times 100 most influential people in the world. And I, I'm, I'm, I must ask you, did you ever think that you'd be where you are right now? What's the next big thing for Fred? Um, I absolutely never thought that I would be anywhere where I am or doing any of these things or getting these recognitions. Or, um, you know, when we started the African Leadership Academy, that's all we thought. We didn't think that it would one day become an African Leadership group <laughs> and that it would go, you know, the vision we set in 2004 was to create one school to train 6,000 people over 50 years. We mm. have no clue that we would be talking about 3 million in, not, in a much shorter period of time. Right? And we didn't think ALA would become ALU, it would become the network, it would become all these things. So one of the, my, my phrases, my favorite quotes is from Bill Gates, who said, most people overestimate what they can achieve in one year and underestimate what they can achieve in 10 years. <laughs> and I think that definitely is what has been the case in my life. Um, and but again, not, none of this would have been possible without collaboration and support and, you know, of, of others and with others. Uh, but I never thought that I would be here. You asked me what's next. Yeah. What's next is for me to become irrelevant. Hmm. Um, you know, I talked about the importance of institution building. If yeah. you build an institution, then you must eventually disappear. The institution can survive without you. You're not needed. And so um, I, I've been quite successful at doing that. You know, I, I used to be the CEO of ALA, the founder. I ran it for 10 years, then I put in place a strong board and management team, and now I'm not involved at all. In fact, when I go to the African Leadership Academy today, the security guard does not recognize me. They say, Why are <laughs> who are you and how can I help you? Yeah. And that's when I know I've done my job. They don't, they don't need me. It stands alone by itself. Wow. Uh, I, was, I was running ALU. Now I'm just the chairman of the board there. There's a great management team and CEO there. And, you know, uh, and with ALX, it's still... And the room, it's still fairly nascent in its journey, but we're moving very fast, building a great team. Um, and my goal is to eventually, again, not be relevant. This is why I never called any of these things Swanika leadership, this or that. It's really because we're working on something that is bigger than me, bigger than anyone else. And I hope that, you know, the institution will, will carry on the ideals. Um, and, uh, you know, I will just be a, a footnote in, in, in the story. Wow. You, you've told us a story of humility and humbling, uh, and you're pretty vulnerable um, when, you, when you started, you know, um, sleeping in, on people's couches, uh, not having a meal uh, from time to time. A desperate lifestyle when you, when you, when you started. Have you ever failed, uh, Fred, in anything at point number one? Point number two, is there anything that you regret? Um, there are very few things that I regret. I don't um, you know, there'll be some minor things that you get like, oh, you know, maybe you should have said this differently in that speech, or you should have <laughs> um, maybe not hired this person who was a bad hire. Those are the things that I regret. But when I think about really big things, I don't really regret anything. Mm. Because I, I, one of the things that I banished from my, my, um, uh, my mind, my psyche is the word failure. Mm. Because failure is a story with shame. You know, you're growing up and they say, don't fail that exam. If you fail, I'll get you in trouble. And people therefore don't want to have that shame. So they don't try. They don't do things. They don't take risks. And I really believe mm. we should all take We don't have time. We have to, especially those of us who are privileged and educated, like I talked about earlier. So I believe that there are only learning opportunities in life. There are either learning opportunities that go according to plan or that they don't go according to plan. But there are always learning opportunities. Right. <laughs> Some people call the learning opportunities that don't go according to plan failures. <laughs> <laughs> I think of it as a learning opportunity. <laughs> and I've had many, many learning opportunities. I have them all the time. <laughs> Fred, Fred, we love books on this show. And I'm going to ask you now to share with our viewers who are all over the world. Uh, the books that you've read, three books at least that you've uh, shaped the way you look at, at the world. So one book 
um, that I've read that has shaped the way that I think about the world is um, is is called uh, the art of community. Seven principles for belonging, mm-hmm. and they talk about how you know most it's you, you cannot build a community by aiming directly at it, right? Because it's something that people feel. You cannot tell them that you 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 belong to a community. They must feel it on their own, and it describes the seven things that you can do to maximize the likelihood of a community emerging. You can aim at those seven things directly, but you cannot, and you can only hope that when they come together, people will feel the community. So that's that's one thing. It shapes a lot of the way I think about building a community of leaders and talent that we're creating through the African Initiative Group. Um, another book that I've read is called Scaling Up Excellence. And uh, it's written by these Stanford professors who look at how, you know, because the big fear with scale is that quality will drop. People say, oh, if it gets big, then systems will not work. But what they find is actually that there's a certain group of companies who, um, when they scale, the opposite happens. The quality actually gets better. The bigger they get, the better it gets. And so he finds that there are ultimately three things that these companies do very well. Number one, they get, above all else, they scale the culture. Right? It's not about the technology, the people, the system, it's about culture. How can you scale the culture if you do that? And the, the quality gets better. The second thing they do well is um, they, they empower the front lines. They really push decision-making down to the person who's dealing with the customer and let, let them run because they have the most information to make the best decision for, for the customer. And then the final thing they do is they drive continuous learning. They're always learning what's working, what's not working, and they drive those innovations throughout the whole organization. The final book I'll talk about is a book called The Advantage. Hmm. Um, and this is a book by Leon Siani who talks about, um, and I wish I'd read this book many, many years ago. It gave me a lot more, you know, much much clarity around what my role as a CEO should be. Basically, he's talking about how do you create healthy organizations. And healthy organizations are organizations that are not only successful, but they are, there's no politics in the organization. People are all aligned. There's this cohesion towards a, 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 an end goal. And he basically talks about how, as a, CEO, there are ultimately four things that you have to do. You have to, number one, create a cohesive leadership team. That's a very strong team, small, but co- that's cohesive, that has trust and vulnerability, and that can have conflict with each other, right? Healthy conflict so that decisions can be best. The second thing you have to do is you have to create clarity around the direction you're going. The third thing you have to do is you have to over communicate clarity, right? <laughs> People what, over and over and over again what you need to do. And then the fourth thing you have to do is you have to reinforce clarity. And that means embedding that clarity into your policies, into your hiring decisions, into your compensation decisions, so that people see that, okay, this guy's serious. This is really what he wants us to do. It, it affects my bonus. It affects my, my, it's part of my performance review. It's all these things. It's part of the policies and organization. So if you do those four things, you're going to have a healthy organization, a successful organization. Uh, and that, that has shaped a lot of my thinking. Wow. Fred, I told you when I started that I absolutely admire what you're doing. You are a great inspiration to me and to a lot of other people. I've been to uh, your job at campus. I've been to your uh, campus in in Mauritius, uh, meeting beautiful minds who are passionate about the continent. I think for me, you are an epitome of what a Pan-Africanist is. You are uh, you live in uh, the idea of being a Pan-Africanist. I love the books that you've recommended right now. And um, I have no doubt in my mind that the work that you're doing and your colleagues and making yourself relevant in the process is going to impact this continent uh, in a big way. So, Fred, thank you so much for creating the time to have this conversation uh, with me. Remain where you are, Fred. And allow me to uh, thank the viewers who are at home all over the world uh, who follow this uh, show on a weekly basis. Remember, we are on YouTube uh, every week on Monday at 7 a.m. Central African time. And to ensure that you don't miss out on any of these quality conversations, I invite you to click here and subscribe. And when you subscribe, you'll get an alert every time we have one of these quality conversations like I've had with uh, uh, Fred Sonica. We've also gone a step further. We are on all podcast platforms, so you'll find our podcast for your listening pleasure. Please subscribe, share, like, and we love your comments uh, below this video, suggestions as to who we should talk to. Until next time, thank you for watching, and cheers to you all.